Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. The first item on the agenda for today's meeting is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. First, I wanted to remind folks we have several ongoing special comment periods and they are located on our website under public comment. Um, but I'll just uh, summarize them here. There are two that are um, out until November 30th, 2020, and that is we're accepting public comment on the hospital budget process, and the materials are located on our website under that public comment um, item. And then the other until the other um, ongoing comment period until November 30th, 2020, is the topic of our meeting today, which is the um, health information exchange plan. And then the last. Uh, ongoing uh, special comment period is the ACO budget. Um, that period will end on December 2nd, 2020. And then I'd also like to announce that um, as of now, we um, our agenda for November 25th, which is next Wednesday, remains TBD. So I just encourage folks to just check our website um, and check on the scheduling the beginning of next week um, to see whether or not we're going to have that meeting. We, we do have it on the calendar as of now, but uh, check back in at the beginning of next week to see what the plan is. And that is all I have to report. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, November 4th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 4th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. So at this point, we're gonna, turn, we're gonna uh, focus our discussion on the health information exchange, and I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Kensler to tee it up for us, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, GNCB Director of Strategy and Operations, and I'm just going to turn off my video and share some slides real quick. Can folks see those slides? We can. Excellent. So I'm just going to do a very quick introduction today to cover our statutory authority and then hand it over to Diva and Vital to present the plan itself and the connectivity criteria. Um, and then I will come back to present the staff review of the 2020 update to the HIE plan and the 2021 V high connectivity criteria afterward. So today we will be talking about two responsibilities that the board has related to um, health information technology and health information exchange. Um, first, reviewing the state HIT plan, which is now known as the HIE plan more commonly. Um, the board's authority is focused on whether or not the plan will support achieving the principles of health care reform laid out in Act 48. Um, and in addition, uh, the HIE plan statute in Section 9351 outlines a variety of features the HIE plan must address or include. Um, the plan is still referred to as the HIT plan in statute, so sometimes you'll, you'll hear me use that title instead. Um, as noted here, DIVA is required to revise the HIE plan annually with a comprehensive update every five years. Um, the current plan was approved in 2018 with an annual update approved in 2019, and today we have the 2020 update before us. Secondly, the board is required to review the connectivity criteria for providers connecting to the VHI. Um, VITAL is required to present that criteria for approval annually before March 1st, um, but since 2018, we've been reviewing the criteria for the coming year uh, in conjunction with the board's HIE plan review since the connectivity criteria are really about how we operationalize HIE planning and the connections to meet the HIE plan goals. Um, the board also reviews and approves VITAL's budget annually in the spring, which I have not included on a slide since it's not on the agenda today. Um, and now I'm just going to turn it over to Diva and VITAL, um, and I'll return after their presentation to talk through the staff analysis. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can. Hi, I'm Emily Richards. I'm the director of the Health Information Exchange Program at DIVA. Um, so I'm going to share the presentation with you. If you just give me one moment here. 
I think. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so Sarah, Sarah mentioned this is the 2020 update to the plan that was approved in um, 2018. Um, this is the plan that's called for under Title 18. Um, and so I'll be running through the components of it today. Um, so as I said, I'm Emily Richards. I'm the director of the Health Information Exchange Program at um, AHS. Uh, Sandy Hoffman was supposed to join me today. She's a newly appointed deputy commissioner, but unfortunately she's not able to join us. Um, so uh, Beth and Carolyn from Vital, do you wanna do a quick introduction before I jump in? Sure. Um, this is Carolyn Stone uh, and I am director of operations at Vital and I'll be presenting the connectivity criteria update later. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, I'm Beth Anderson, CEO at Vital. Great, thanks, Beth. Okay. Um, all right, so today I hope to do a couple of things. Um, first, review the core concept, concepts underpinning the HIE plan. Um, we came up with a number of sort of guiding principles or guiding tenants in 2018, and those continue to guide our work. Um, and so I just wanted to review those with the board and participants to make sure that um, the process for strategic planning was very clear. Um, we thought we'd go over uh, progress made in 2020, as well as um, plans ahead for 2021, based on the progress we've made this year, and then review the evolution of the HIE ecosystem. The HIE ecosystem is something I'll talk about, but basically the component parts um, that need to advance in order, uh, or excuse me, need to work together in order to advance an HIE effort. Um, we'll talk a little bit about where we thought we'd be in terms of maturity and where we expect to go. Um, and I've been having a little bit of a microphone challenge. So if you're having any trouble hearing me, please just let me know. Coming through clearly now. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, so, um, the idea behind the HIE plan is to drive progress um, in a sort of a transparent and accountable manner. And so to do that, um, the HIE plan covers three essential elements. First, the specific goals um, and vision for how we'd like to exchange health data. Um, so the sort of aim or drive is very clear. Second, the HIE ecosystem or the environment required for HIE to effectively function, which I'd like to go into a little bit more. And then clear objectives and tactical plans. So our progress can be measured and the plan ahead is very clear. So in 2017, when the, when the steering committee um, initially joined, um, they spent some time pulling together use cases or sort of stories that articulate how um, folks might use health data to improve their work. Um, so this goes from providers to analysts to policymakers. And what they were able to do looking across um, those different user needs was to roll up the goals of each of those users into these sort of three um, overarching goals for the system. And these continue to be our North Star. And so the goals are to create one health record for every person to support optimal care delivery and coordination. Um, so this, we're working to ensure uh, a complete and ac accurate, what we call longitudinal health record for every person who uh, seeks care in Vermont. The second is to improve healthcare operations, enriching care operations through data collection and analysis. So that can be to support quality improvement, reporting and direct care, and to use data to enable investment and policy decisions. So an overarching look at how we bolter the health systems function, uh, functions, excuse me, and ability to learn by providing um, accurate and comprehensive data. So the next core concept here that sort of underpins the strategic planning work that we do um, is, is this combination of things. Here's the, here on the left, you see the HIE ecosystem, this sort of triangle diagram. Um, and what we think this does is it represents sort of the dependent parts that have to work together to advance an HIE effort. What this means is that you need formalized governance, um, financing to ensure that there are appropriate resources to maintain your systems and advance your systems, and the appropriate policy and processes to facilitate um, the type of data collection and exchange you're trying to do. And all 
all of that underpins the technology. Um, what we wrote in 2018 in the initial HIE plan is that a focus on technology is myopic, meaning that um, it's, uh, it's sort of a, a a single focus um, without a, a look for what the dependencies would be in order to ensure that that technology is appropriately used and leveraged and funded. Um, and so that's how we think about the HIE eco ecosystem. And so when the, the steering committee embarks on um, both developing and uh, overseeing the execution of the strategic plan, they're thinking about how all of these component parts work together to advance our work. And what you see on the right here is the technology portion of that blown out. Um, and so how we think about technology is really inspired by um, something from the Af Office of the National Coordinator, which is the federal uh, entity designated with strategic planning for health information exchange nationwide. Um, and what they say is that um, HIE systems are kind of built in this modular, modular way. I often use the metaphor of a house. that You build the foundation first and then think about the walls and the windows, which is this sort of middle section here that we're calling exchange services. And then you can pick the paint color and, you know, do you have a smart oven or not, um, you know, where, where you're going to hang the drapes. And so um, when we think about foundational and exchange services, we're looking at that's where we look at where uh, public investment would be focused. And end user services are um, only able to occur um, once those foundational and exchange services are in place. So kind of all of these component parts are our guiding principles for strategic planning. So going on to the next. Okay, so one really important piece of governance um, in Vermont is the HIE Steering Committee, who, who I keep referring to. Um, they were joined together in 2017, really in response to a statewide evaluation that talked about our fractured governance um, and how that had impacted our progress on health information exchange uh, efforts um, in, in the uh, recent past. So um, in 2017, that group got together and 2018 presented you with an HIE plan. And in uh, the Vermont legislature gave them authority under Title 18 to work with DIVA to develop and oversee the strategic plan for the state. So this group is intentionally kept small um, to support um, agile and quick strategic planning, as you know, year over year. We're updating the plan while we are overseeing execution. Um, and they're guided by subcommittees who are formed um, as group of groups of technical experts um, to provide uh, the, these uh, group of this group of people um, with the technical or uh, planning insights they may need um, on specific topics. And the steering committee is also committed to leveraging groups that already exist. Um, so we're not, um, you know, uh, sort of bombarding the limited group of uh, folks who may be interested in this in Vermont um, with, you know, more groups to participate in rather leveraging um, this, the tables that they're already seated at. In this next slide, um, this is something we went over in 2018, but I just, you know, in reviewing our past materials, felt like it was um, an important thing to uh, go over again, um, you know, because as I mentioned in 2017, or excuse me, in, yes, in 2017, there was a statewide evaluation that noted that um, HIE governance in Vermont was fragmented. And we've really come together, I think, over the last couple of years with a solidified look at roles and accountability in, in our HIE governance model. So I think they're important to go over. So of course, first up here is the HIE steering committee, which I've just gone over. And this is where stakeholders go to um, set priorities, propose policy, um, talk about operational direction. Where do decision makers go for support? As I mentioned, these ad hoc subcommittees are groups that already exist. Who's responsible for oversight? Of course, that's you, the Green Mountain Care Board, as you approve the HIE plan and VITALS budget. Who provides HIE services? Um, that's VITAL and other HIE vendors like Bi-State Primary Care, One Care Vermont. And how are these service providers held accountable? And for us, that's through performance-based contracts, um, which have been refined considerably in the last couple of years, um, so that it's very clear to see uh, how HIE services are funded in the state. So before I move on to talking about the 2020 work and 2021 plans ahead, are there any questions about sort of those um, core principles or core things that underpin the strategic planning process? Are there any questions from the board? I don't hear any, Emily. Okay, great. I'll keep going. Thank you. Okay, so let's jump into 2020 progress and our 2021 plans ahead. 
So I'm going to start with the Collaborative Services Project, and I think you're familiar with this, but just as a reminder, this was kind of our cornerstone effort over the last couple of years to bolster the Vermont Health Information Exchange or the VHI to meet a broad range of end user needs um, with, you know, the core mission of the HIE, which is to be a central aggregator of health data. Um, so this kicked off in 2019, and we gained, gained commitment from a number of stakeholders um, who were funded separately um, to sort of build wraparound services um, because of, of um, uh, I guess, perceived need um, in the ecosystem. And so um, they've all joined uh, together as a collective to agree to um, this investment in the foundational services offered by the HIE. Um, so what we're hoping to do is invest in one system as an efficient way to obtain valuable us usable data to meet all of those goals that we talked about up front. So the projects manage in phases. Um, phase one um, and phase two are well underway, and we'll talk about uh, plans for phases three and four. So phase one, um, you know, we just talked about uh, the sort of the foundational services. So this is an investment in, in um, solidifying the master patient index, terminology services, and integration engine at the health information exchange. And so um, when I think of these in non-technical terms, this is how the HIE matches records across systems. So different doctors sending, doc, different doctor offices sending records, matching our records into one for each person, terminology services taking many ways to say one thing, or yeah, many ways to say one thing, like many ways to say blood pressure and translating it into one term or syntax that works for um, whoever's using the data and an integration engine, which means um, collecting the data and sending it to the right place. Um, so all of these updates are live and they're proving to enhance the HIE services. Um, so uh, as an example here, we're seeing great results in match rates. Um, so match rates for reference population went from approximately 65% to over 95% after um, they implemented the new technology. So phase two is well underway. This is a new data repository. So the idea um, beyond just sort of real-time exchange of data is to collect that data for different uses, um, policy uh, uh, and legislative analysis, namely. Um, and so uh, a group called the Collaborative Services Subcommittee helped Vital um, select a new data repository by understanding what unique um, user needs would be for this data repository. And they ended up selecting um, a technology from a group called MedicaSoft. This platform is expected to be live in April 2021 with an enhancements thereafter. And one of the, I think, um, sort of demonstrations uh, that this, this concept is working is that um, the Department of Vermont Health Access was able to retire an old piece of technology used by the Blueprint for Health, a clinical repository, um, because we'll now be able to leverage this platform for data extracts um, beginning in 2021. So this Collaborative Services Subcommittee continues to provide insights to um, VITAL as they work through the implementation of the new data repository and um, in um, a point in time assessment um, that they delivered to the steering committee concluded that the new platform will meet the data needs of the subcommittee members. Moving on to um, phases three and four of the projects that we plan to do ahead. So, Phase three is managing new data types. The steering committee agreed um, that um, aggregation of an expanded data in the VHI would be valuable, including data representing social determinants of health, substance use disorders, mental health, behavioral health, and claims data. Um, the goal, you know, we, we've talked about the goal of one record for every person um, and having a longitudinal look at that at, um, individual's health. And the steering committee agrees that um, physical health data coming solely from electronic health records is not enough uh, and that we need to aggregate uh, greater data sources so that users can have a holistic look at um, people's health and the impacts on their health. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we expect to work on that in 2021. Um, but before I do, just to talk a little bit about sort of what's after this public investment or um, uh, phases one through three of the project. So phases four, we're calling just decision support and analytics. And this is where customers of the VHI come in. Um, and, um, you know, we talked about the foundation of the house, the windows and the doors, and then the, the sort of fun stuff, the paint color and the bells and whistles. Um, phases four is the paint color and the bells and whistles. So this is where customers would come to the VHI and say, you now have the base HIE uh, technology up. Uh, you are meeting your mission of 
uh, aggregating and exchanging health data. Here's how we'd like to use your services. So this would be an area where um, public investment was not focused. Okay. So just a quick look at um, how we expect to um, help vital onboard or aggregate new data types. Um, in green, you're seeing the policy components and yellow, the governance components. And this deep gray is technology. Um, and so what we're saying for, if you sort of look across the swim lanes, read from left to right, on the left, you're seeing the data type and the right, uh, the plans, um, each of the H HIE ecosystem component parts um, needed to um, aid in the uh, collection of new data types. So physical health is at the top. That's what we're calling the data that comes from electronic health records now, leaving out substance use disorder, behavioral health and mental health data. Um, and so um, as examples of things that we need to do to support this effort, um, connectivity criteria subcommittee will work to ensure that there are appropriate definitions and standards for collecting this data type. Um, the interface prioritization subcommittee will work to ensure that um, vitals uh, connectivity goals for the year to come support um, aggregation of physical health data. We'll come up with policies um, around that. Um, and then the Collaborative Services Subcommittee will continue to help VITAL in implementing um, the base technology to support um, the enhanced um, management, quote unquote, of, these data, the, of this data. And then social determinants of health, uh, we are doing a, currently a pilot project with one care between the Agency of Human Services and One Care Vermont um, to collect uh, AHS data and share it with One Care um, to support uh, their risk stratification model. Um, and so that's phase one of testing um, using Vital uh, to aggregate this data type. Um, so in the process of doing that, the policies that we need are data sharing agreements and connectivity criteria on this this specific data type. And then we will um, convene a social determinants of health subcommittee. Um, to talk about um, what additional policies we need to expand um, the types of the sources of social determinants of health data coming into the VHI and those that are able to access it. Um, going down to substance use disorder, behavioral health, and mental health. Um, we had a, a, a pilot project this year as well for this data type. Um, uh, the state legislator, legislature uh, decided to fund uh, the purchase of electronic health record systems for a number of the DAs, and in that asked um, them to work with VITAL and the steering committee to ensure interoperability. So uh, the connectivity criteria is enhanced, um, has been enhanced this year um, to include um, substance use disorder and mental health uh, data types. Um, we are looking at uh, potentially proposing a policy update um, to the protocols for access to data on the VHI to allow um, for additional uh, data of this sort um, to be aggregated by the VHI. There'll be a stakeholder informed process to do so. Um, and so this is kind of the pilot for this uh, year and next. Um, and then similarly, we'll convene a subcommittee to look at what it would mean to aggregate um, these data types beyond designated agencies. And then finally for claims, um, the steering committee since 2018 has um, posited that uh, integration of clinical and claims data would further uh, the goals set forth in the plan. And so here we are embarking on um, a pilot to design what it would mean to um, aggregate claims at the VHI with a focus on Medicaid claims data first. Okay. So that was a lot. Should I stop for questions or keep going? Does anybody have any questions? This is Robin. I have a couple questions. Go ahead. Um, hi, Emily. I hope you're well. Um, starting with the what you just ended with around the claims data, um, I'm wondering, and this may be a premature question, but I want to get it out there so you can be thinking about it. Um, what is the interaction between what would be happening in the VHI and VCURES? Because obviously we're already collecting claims data, so are we going to be collecting it twice? How is that going to work? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Where, did you no, have one more? Yeah. Well, my other sort of related to that is, um, so if, if, the data is collected from the payers, then you have to worry about ERISA preemption. So I'm assuming that there will be somebody working on that aspect of it. And my other sort of related 
question or thought is if it's possible to collect the claims directly from providers when they're submitting it, which may or may not be the right time, um, you may be able to get a fuller uh, set of claims. So, I mean, those are all great questions and I think the work of the subcommittee to do. So the subcommittee is going to look at doing something that we've never done before, which is yeah. meeting first defining use cases. So how do we need to use clinical and claims together? And so what are we trying to build for? Um, and then what would that mean for existing systems and existing processes? So one thing that the steering committee has, has determined early on and really that was fed by the 2017 evaluation is that there are inefficiencies in the system. So I wouldn't want to say that there is not going to be a look at potential overlap between VHI and VCURES because that could be something that comes up in the subcommittee. But the idea would be for us to come out with a pilot design um, so that users can really look at what the system implementation approach would be, um, including what policies we'd need, um, where where data would lie, you know, to answer all of the questions. And I think one thing particularly that the Green Mountain Care Board staff brought up is um, it will be important to do it with, with Medicaid data, but Medicaid data is unique in a lot of ways. So we're likely going to have to do this design work, excuse me, with commercial claims as well. Great. And presumably Medicare as well. Oh, Medicare as well. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, and then related to the social determinants of health data, I happened to be on the Blueprint Executive Committee call this morning, and they were talking about the Women's Health Initiative and, and how the practices that they're working with are collecting some social determinants of health data. So I was curious to know if um, the Blueprint is involved in, in the work or that you guys are connecting so that we're really getting, figuring out the right places to be pulling uh, data that's already being collected? It's a great question. So there is a blueprint representative on the steering committee. Um, and of course, Steve chairs it, but we can always all do a better job of, you know, being coordinated. Um, so women's health is um, a data type that we've specifically called out as something that needs to be looked at. Um, and I, I will put this on my radar, but I think sort of similarly to the claims subcommittee, a lot of work to be done ahead on social determinants of health, particularly on social determinants of health in some ways will be the most challenging because we yeah. do not have a lot of federal and state laws guiding us. That makes sense. Thank you. Those were my my questions. Thanks. Other questions from the board? I'm not hearing any, Emily, so I guess proceed. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about COVID, COVID response. And we're, as we're all sitting in our home offices. Um, so, uh, you know, as you can imagine, nationwide there's been, um, there have traditionally been data sharing challenges between public health um, and sort of the broader healthcare community. So that's not new to um, HIE. So uh, what is new, to, new in this situation is, um, how clear it has become that health information exchanges are, can be really um, essential to the public health response. So by that, I mean that HIEs exist um, to create efficiencies and connectivity. So for um, from data source to the HIE creating one pipeline of data, as opposed to a public health entity having to create their own pipelines of data, and then the HIE um, creating those pipelines um, separately with, with the existence of HIEs and really the purpose of HIEs is to gather data from multiple sources into one central spot. Um, HIEs offer uh, just enhanced data quality because it is their business um, to translate different data, data types for different users. And so that is a model of practice that they already have in existence. Um, they obviously offer the record matching service that we were talking about the our HIE in Vermont has just enhanced, um, but this again is a core function of an HIE uh, to match records across systems um, and not necessarily a core function of a public health entity. So it's a service that an HIE can offer. Um, it also acts as a, I'm describing a central access point to, to clinical data, meaning that um, as their core function is to bring clinical data from electronic health records into one place. Um, so just sort of to paint the picture, nationwide we've dealt with uh, sort of a discrepancy in how public health data is managed and, and the existence of HIE, HIEs um, can help 
um, with uh, some of sort of the siloed or fractured nature of public health data collection. So in Vermont specifically, in early eight, April, the Secretary of AHS um, issued a directive for Vital to provide access to patient data um, on the VHI to AHS, um, to VDH um, specifically, to, to support the, the COVID war response effort. Um, throughout uh, the duration of the governor's declared state of emergency. So a number of things have happened in April um, to, to support this effort. And um, if you don't mind, I'll go over it at a high level, but I think any questions should probably be directed to Beth and Carolyn of Vital um, because this work is evolving so quickly. But I guess just sort of to say this, this is a long list of things that they've been um, working on since April, but I would summarize their actions as um, working with um, the Department of Health, the Agency of uh, Digital Services and AHS at large to automate state and federal reporting, both for uh, the Department of Health and for hospitals. Um, they've also been helping with those daily reports that we see um, on COVID response. They've um, aided VDH in doing the contact tracing um, work so that uh, staff don't have to reach out to providers um, who are already burdened to gain um, necessary details to do contact tracing. And that same data has helped with syndromic modeling. Um, they've um, provided data to support care coordination work and um, they've acted as the central aggregator for test results, um, which supports the Department of Health in tracking um, those test results and also for providers who are able to log into the system to see patients who have been tested. So there's a lot of information here. So I'm just going to stop for a moment in case there are specific questions about the response effort that's underway. Are there questions from the board? Uh, yeah, I have one. I, I saw in a... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Joint Fiscal Committee recently met and um, awarded, you know, recognizing what you have up on the screen now, $931,000 to DIVA. And I'm just wondering of if any of that flows through to VITAL. Yes, all that all of that um, is intended to um, cover work that DIVA has already paid for under the contract or is ongoing through the remainder of the year. Um, so yes, the COVID response fund um, was the funding request was approved. Um, and I think as you stated, which is basically recognizes the importance of Vitals work in aiding the COVID response effort. In 2021, we've built into our contract um, uh, monies to continue the COVID response effort. Um, so if there was not COVID response funding available um, going forward, that work can be accounted for under the contract. Well, thank you for that. I, I know when I was talking to Sarah earlier in the week about this, uh, it's just uh, amazing that those reports that some of us kind of are taking interest in every single day, you know, are coming off the vital and uh, the HIE platform. And it's just, uh, and that it happened so fast. So congratulations to all of you on that. Beth or Carolyn, did you want to add anything there? I think you covered it perfectly. Thank you. Before I forget, though, I would like to uh, thank Beth and Vital for um, not only the COVID uh, response, but also for the, the help that they've uh, given in the uh, cybersecurity uh, issues that are currently being dealt with by the network. So um, Vital has really been proving its worth. So thank you. Thank you. We are happy to be helpful where we can. Unfortunate circumstances, but happy to be helpful. Yes, the silver lining, I think we all agree, has been that Vital has been able to demonstrate how valuable an HIE can really be in times of emergency um, and hopefully in day-to-day -day work. So when we think about continuing this momentum that the um, Department of Health and um, Vital are, are really seeing the benefit in integration, um, as I mentioned, we're going to keep the COVID work um, going for as long as necessary under the current contract. Um, our federal partners are um, in the long term outside of an emergency, very interested in HIE and public health integration. And so this is certainly in their wheelhouse of things that they are um, willing to fund. Um, and then thinking about prep for future emergencies, um, Vital is uh, has proposed you know continued work so that in the event of a future emergency, the HIE is um, sort of ready and established to support things like automated hospital reporting um, and um, lab data collection. 
We've also been talking to the Department of Health about leveraging the HIE uh, functionalities to enhance their registries. Um, and so one piece of work that's well, the immunization um, connection to the HIE already already existed, and so we're talking about enhancing that. But the another piece of work that's new is um, death registry connection to the HIE, so that providers have access to real time death information, which has been a challenge in Vermont for many years. Okay, um, and then. I actually updated this slide, so I hope you don't mind. I think I articulated it in a confusing way before. So um, I also wanted to note that the protocols for access to protected health information on the VHI have um, been updated to do a couple of things. Articulate how health data um, is can be accessed by VDH um, from the VHI to support VDH's man work that's mandated by federal and state law. Um, as an example, immunization reporting. Um, and then um, it articulates this concept of a significant public health risk, which is already in state law, um, but it basically allows the commissioner of the De Department of Health to determine when it would be necessary um, to access um, a great data for uh, uh, emergency response or to mitigate a public health risk. Um, so that, as a reminder, those protocols are um, were sort of the next iteration of the consent policy that now lives within the HIE plan for your approval. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to move on from the COVID work. Okay, another big, if you can imagine, lots of big things happening this year. Another big thing that uh, SHU that dropped this year was the final interoperability, quote unquote, rules from um, uh, U.S. Health and human services. So this is a joint set of rules from the Office of the National Coordinator and CMS um, that basically are intended to work together to put the patient at the center of their health care by opening a window to them, to their own health care, and a window to um, information about their health care providers. So the way that they work together is the Office of the National Coordinator sort of sets the technical framework um, and enforcement tech and enforcement um, uh, framework. Um, that CMS builds off of. Um, and so they're each kind of regulating different actors to drive um, efforts that will open data access to patients. So the Office of the National Coordinator is really focused on, um, oh, I'll move to the next one, this one, um, focused on uh, health information exchanges, health IT developers, and healthcare providers, um, and how they access, how they open access to data. And I'm going to use a techie term for just a second. It's called an API. I think about it as a window um, into data. So uh, we open our window, you open your window, and then we can share information across the open windows. That's the idea. And so there's um, a technical framework for doing so. They've also enhanced IT, the IT certification process for IT developers, um, and they've defined a term called information blocking to provide prevent um, folks from not sharing patient data. Um, and then they've raised the baseline for data exchange standards, um, relying now on something called the U.S. Core uh, Data Set for interoperability, which is just an enhancement to federal standards that already existed. So the next one, the CMS Interoperability and Patient Access Final Rules, um, they're focused on um, payers providing Medicare Advantage, Medicaid CHIP, and QHPs on the federally facilitated exchanges. So in Vermont, that's really, it's just Medicaid that's impacted here. Um, and so they're relying on the technical standards set forth by the ONC, as I said, to drive action. Um, and so that will mean for Medicaid opening access to claims and encounter data um, for Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, I kind of, I sort of breezed over that one because it, it can get a little technical quick, um, but the idea there was just to leave you with the notion that there are new federal rules, um, again, uh, an effort from the federal government to enhance, or excuse me, um, further this idea of interoperability or systems talking to one another. And so if you think back to that, the beginning of the High Tech Act, it was in to digitize electronic health records. So to get money to healthcare organizations, so they purchased electronic health records. So we could just start moving from paper um, to, elect to electronic health records. And then they expanded the funding and wanted to amplify health information exchanges. So there were entities that could collect and exchange this data. And now as a further step, they're saying that they want to promote interoperability by opening, um, or excuse me, creating a framework whereby patients have access to their own data. Okay, so 
I'm going to move on to the next one. Okay. So in 2020, the, um, or I should say in 2019, the uh, steering committee set forth a lot of work um, to go forward into 2020. And a lot of work happen has happened this year, despite all of the, the myriad challenges that have come up in our health system. So the first is the collaborative services subcommittee that we talked about a little bit. Those are the group of people who help to vital procure a data repository, define what the, their use cases were, and assess for the steering committee. Um, how they think the collaborative services project is going to further the goals set forth in the HIE plan. Um, and so they're gonna continue, or I guess I, that is on the next slide, so I won't preempt myself. So in um, the 2020, the connectivity criteria subcommittee got together, they updated the connectivity criteria, which Carolyn will present, and then they expanded the focus to support connectivity with designated agencies. And as I mentioned, that's sort of a pilot program for how VITAL will manage substance use disorder, mental health, and behavioral health data. Um, the interface prioritization subcommittee came up with a matrix to help um, us uh, uh, support vital in annually selecting connectivity prior priorities. And by connectivity priorities, I mean um, which how resources will be funded to connect healthcare organizations to the HIE. Uh, this consent subcommittee continued their work in evaluating the rollout of the um, shift in the consent policy. Um, and uh, there is uh, an assessment of this work, although we're expecting uh, major findings from the patient engagement survey, which will be um, available later this month. And then finally, the part two plus group, which is a group that Vital's leading, um, is uh, an effort to pull together stakeholders to de develop an informed um, policy and uh, processes at Vital for managing substance use disorder data and other sensitive data types. Um, this work um, will be largely impacted by um, the rollout of the CARES Act, um, but VITAL has begun um, by really uh, designing a really robust stakeholder engagement process um, to be ready for that. So looking ahead for these groups in 2021, the Collaborative Services Subcommittee is going to aid VITAL in developing a long, longer term technical roadmap. So thinking about the future phases of collaborative services, how will the HIE platform be used um, to, uh, to meet the needs of Vermont's customers. The connectivity criteria subcommittee will continue to update the criteria, considering changes to federal law, considering changes in Vermont's needs, um, and then update that criteria depending on how far we get with um, updated, uh, or excuse me, new data types. So for example, expanding to include social determinants of health. The Interface Prioritization Subcommittee will develop annual connectivity pri priorities. They'll be working on that um, in the early part of 2021. New Population Health Subcommittee um, will be looking to advise um, vital and other health data producers and aggregate, aggregators on needed um, data sets to augment research and population health management efforts. Um, so it hasn't felt like we've really had a table um, of advisors to sit down and talk about how um, that, that data repository, uh, or excuse me, how uh, upcoming research or population health management needs um, so that vital and other health data producers can prepare. Um, and in 2021, we're going to focus that group on social determinants of health. Um, the part two group will continue, as I mentioned, and really their work ahead is going to be um, impact, but impacted by the uh, CARES Act. And um, uh, yeah, so the, we expect that uh, depending on how uh, the final rules for the um, CARES Act come out, um, that we may be coming back midterm um, with an update to uh, the protocols for data access um, on the VHI. Uh, if if it does look like we're able to advance with the aggregation of sensitive data types this year. Um, the Outcomes Based Certification Subcommittee is also a new group. Uh, CMS has offered us a new opportunity to certify the HIE, which is uh, which opens the door to maintenance funding of the HIE, which has never been before been available to us. Um, and so we are will be one of the first states to pursue pursue the certification of an HIE. Um, and so we're working now to define the outcome measures um, that will um, hopefully allow us collectively um, to measure the value of the VHI going forward. And then the claims pilot subcommittee, which I think um, to Robin's question, we discussed a little bit before, but basically they'll be designing a pilot to test the integration of claims data into the VHI. Um, and then just a couple of notes on the um, 
the steering committee going forward, the committee um, has requested that we invite new representatives from long-term care and home health. So um, the CEO from C Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice will be joining us and we're still looking for a long-term long care representative. Okay. So, I threw this up there one more time just to kind of reiterate sort of all the subcommittee work that we're doing for the year ahead, but I think we've gone over it. Okay. And then I'm putting this one up one more time because I just wanted to spend a moment talking about Diva and Vital's contract for um, calendar year 21. Um, we have are still in negotiations, so I can't tell you the details, but I wanted to um, uh, go over one, I think, important point, which is that um, since we've created this concept, the and you know we talked about accountability and clarity and transparency. Vitals contracts with Diva um, have mirrored this these concepts that we have in the HIE plan, including investments in Tier One and Tier Two of this um, sort of stack of HIE capabilities that we talk about. So another way to look at it is on the left, you're seeing that same stack. Um, it's just now in a pyramid. Um, and on the right, you're seeing kind of concepts that um, we should see in the calendar year 21 contract with um, between Diva and Vital. So for example, at the foundational level, um, we're investing in um, uh, an, an MPI, which is already done, um, policy management, uh, the MedicaSoft platform, which is that data repository, exchange services. We're talking about um, translating data, interoperating systems, um, end user services. That would be things that um, go beyond sort of the foundation of, of public investment, but um, we are also kind of wearing the hat as a consumer of HIE services. So that's COVID-19 reporting, Medicaid services reporting, and the extra oh. for the blue card for health. And then at the top here, um, there are some end user services that we will be funding, and that is to ensure that um, the HIE uh, meets the uh, new interoperability rules and um, can uh, provide access to patients as directed by federal law. Um, and then it's to ensure that we're ready to certify the HIE system so that we can gain federal investment to main the, maintain the system in the long term. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to shift gears and go over to the HIE ecosystem parts unless there are questions. Not hearing any, so you might as well proceed. Sorry, this is Robin. I took me a while to get to the mute. I had a question on um, the pr provider access to protected health information protocol, but I can come back to it later if that would be better. Oh, I'm happy to go back. Do you want me to hear outline and let me pull this up? Whatever works best for you, Robin. Um, well, I'll throw it out there because I, um, my question, you probably are going to need to take back to general counsel or VDH. So let me just get them out there and if it would be helpful for me to work with Sarah to email them so that they're clearer for the translation, just let me know. Okay. Um, thank you for your, the slide I thought was clear. In the actual um, oh, policy mind. document, I found the drafting of section five, the public health access to be a little bit confusing um, because there's a paragraph B and a paragraph D and I would read them as interacting, but that's not clear from the document. So I think with some minor modifications that could be clarified. Um, so that would be one thing that I would be looking for before we vote on it. Um, and then I also have some questions about the definition of public health authorities in terms of how broad or narrow that is. Um, it clearly to me would include VDH, um, their county level officers and uh, the CDC, but I'm not sure if it's intended to be broader than that. So that was the other clarification that I was hoping to, to get. Okay, you are right. I feel like I will need to take those back, but thank you. I think I got them, but um, if, if writing them down is possible, that would be great too. Absolutely. Um, okay, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a really great collaboration between board staff and Department of Health and DIVA in trying to get these protocols in the right place. So thank you very much for everybody's work so far and thanks for the work ahead. Okay. 
So um, the final thing I'm hoping to do before I turn it over to Vital to talk about the connectivity criteria is just to revisit these HIE ecosystem component parts. Um, because in the original 2018 plan, we talked about sort of maturity models for each. And so I wanted to revisit where we think we are and where we think we're going. Um, so um, as Robin just um, asked a question about, um, you know, we've uh, we are introducing updates to the protocols um, for access uh, to data on the VHI. And what, um, what I've sort of circled here is this statewide consent management. So what we basically have in these protocols uh, is a unified consent management process that articulates um, how we uh, govern um, the physical health data or the data, the clinical data coming directly from electronic health records without sort of that clinically sensitive data included. Um, and so uh, what we think is the evolution is that um, sort of all of the organizations that comprise the network are building aligned processes. So we think that there we will continue to evolve these protocols and continue to update um, HIE plan to reflect that evolution. And so we think likely the next up um, topic to be considered would be clinically sensitive data. Again, waiting for those federal rules to come down. Um, but um, if uh, what's expected is that uh, there'll be greater alignment between HIPAA and Part 2. We will be able to articulate um, how we are uh, manifesting that new data collection through the VHI in Vermont. So looking at finance, um, a couple of things to note here, I think which we've been talking about for a couple of years. First, the, the U.S. High Tech Act funding, um, which was really stimulus funding, um, which we've been using since 2011. It, it, um, expires at the end of next year, September 2021. Um, and so this means that um, a lot of the development dollars that we've used to uh, amplify the HIE, to build out the public health systems, um, and to incentivize the adoption of electronic health records um, are going away. Um, what CMS says, though, as you can tell from the interoperability rules, is their investment in this work is not done, but it is changing. Um, and so they are shifting from something that was um, basically a stimulus fund to um, more traditional Medicaid enterprise systems funding, which with, comes with different rules um, about who can benefit from the funding and how costs are allocated. Um, they're also offering, as I mentioned, this outcomes-based certification process, which opens a new door for us to obtain maintenance funds. Uh, right now, um, uh, a great portion of the state's HIT fund is used to maintain the HIE, and so um, opening the door to more federal investment would, would just allow more dollars for development work. Um, I'm noting here that the steering committee supports an extension of the HIT fund. The HIT fund is that small claims tax on private funds that's been used to propel this work for a number of years. Uh, the HIT fund generally um, sunsets every year and the legislature reviews the HIE work um, and uh, suggests that it, it continues. Um, last two years ago, it was extended for two years, um, considering the progress being made by the state and vital. Um, and so we go before the legislature again this coming session um, to hopefully get that HIT fund extended. Um, without those resources, it would be a real challenge to continue this work. Um, and finally, just a note that the Collaborative Services Project ex is expected to position the VHI to provide demand-driven services. So again, in sort of that phase four of the project, um, it, you know, opening the door to customers um, to work directly with Vital um, on leveraging the HIE services that would benefit them. Okay. On the governance part of the HIE ecosystem, I just thought it was important to note, and um, we have a new section in, or a new um, narrative in this year about data governance. Um, and we were calling out specifically a couple of things. One, that Vital does not own health data. Rather, it acts as, as the stored of health data that originates from various sources. Um, and so because that's true, we need a comprehensive way to govern the way that um, data is made available, accessed, how systems um, interchange the data, how that data access is audited, the quality of the data, and the security of the data. And so what the steering committee has agreed to do is ensure that there is sort of a current of data governance within the subcommittees, and then the larger sub steering committee itself will be used to pull together the different data governance concepts and work with other data governance entities like at the HIE and at AHS. And on technology, so, you know, we, we 
continue to use that sort of stack diagram. We're talking about the foundation of the house, the exchange services and the end user services on top. But um, we took another look at um, a way to depict um, the architecture of the HIE in Vermont um, this year and, and the steering committee agreed. So this is kind of a look ahead, although a lot of these systems are already in place. So you see that Vitals infrastructure is sort of central here where we've got bi-directional feeds between electronic health records and the um, HIE infrastructure itself. The HIE can, um, has a data warehouse, meaning that it can, it can aggregate and um, extract a different data. Um, it has the ability to do translations or um, uh, take many terms and translate them into one, depending on the, uh, the user need to match MPIs, match uh, patient records across systems, and then um, to use the integration engine to make sure that the parts of the records that need to get to where they are, get to the right place. Um, you see on the right here, there's um, non-EHR, non-electronic health record data sources feeding in. So that's to look at potentially getting insurance claims, geographic information, more social determinants of health data, and then public health data. Um, and then um, feeding all of those data types out um, for population and public health work, um, and then for provider and patient access and analytics work. So that's just a sort of a, a new structure that uh, the HIE steering committee thought um, represented sort of the, the work that we're trying to do as building the HIE, uh, to, in building the HIE as sort of central to the HIE ecosystem um, technologically in Vermont. Okay. So that it concludes my part of the presentation. So um, Carolyn, I have this slide up for you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as a review, the connectivity criteria is a tiered system that establishes standards for connecting and meeting the data quality goals of the VHI and our downstream stakeholders who use the data. Um, as Emily mentioned, um, we've based the criteria based on the federal interoperability standards that were passed earlier this year as part of the ONC Cures Act. Um, this includes the, the US CDI or the US core data for interoperability set. Um, and, you know, in the past few years, our initial criteria was mainly based on primary care physical health providers. Um, so as we started to explore taking on these new data types, um, it became clear that we needed additional ways of categorizing or measuring data quality for the different organizations. Um, so, you know, for an, as an example, um, mental or behavioral health providers are not expected to run cholesterol tests, but they may be expected to run red blood cell count tests, which are very common when treating substance use patients. Um, so, you know, to, to support bringing on this new data type in the future, uh, VITAL and the Connectivity Criteria Subcommittee worked um, to develop new criteria for mental health and behavioral health organizations. Our work was um, primarily based on the expertise and data being collected by the designated agencies. We worked closely with Vermont Care Partners and their member agencies uh, and the rest of the subcommittee to influence and um, guide our, our decisions. Um, but it really is meant to serve the broader group of, of organizations going forward. That was just a great starting place because the designated agencies implementing their new EMRs this year um, had a really good view into their data and making sure that their data could meet what was needed. Um, so that was that was a major effort. Um, but in addition to that, we also um, did a review of the existing physical health criteria. Um, and we decided that that was working fairly well. You know, this year has been definitely disrupted by COVID and much attention and focus has been there. Um, so we did add the COVID-19 vaccination to the tier two immunization list knowing how important that's going to be for all immunization data to be collected that way for the state once the vaccine becomes available. Um, so that, and, and we've provided all of these documents, all the standard documents associated with the criteria um, as an attachment to the HIE plan. Are there any questions on that? A brief summary.
Will it make any difference um, if the vaccines were made available free or not on your ability with the data? It should not. We're working closely with the Vermont Department of Health and the teams, the logistics teams and everyone else in the state um, on the statewide plan to ensure that we can try and capture as much of that data as possible um, electronically from whoever's providing it, irregardless of whether it's free or not. CVS and Walgreens are the two major pharmacy chains who will be leading the the vaccine efforts with that the federal government is paying for. And we're already connected to CVS and we're in the process of trying to connect Walgreens right now in preparation for that. Super, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just ask a quick question. I'm just wondering if the recent cyber attack has changed people's willingness to consent to having their records, um, you know, accessible. Has it changed any of the opt-in, opt-out data or discussions? Um, I think in some ways, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to providers who would like to be able to see their own data, then, um, they're very much in favor of sharing data with us at this point because they've seen the value of it. If you're talking about patients, um, I would have to check to see whether the numbers did go up, the number of opt-out or the number of conversations that we got, you know, asked about would have we, to go. We, we haven't seen a large, we haven't seen a change that would indicate there was um, a big shift, um, right. at least initial looks, yeah. And, you know, if you don't mind me adding one thing, this is the hard part about consent is, you know, data is aggregated in electronic health records. So the VHI is just collecting it for exchange. And so that, I mean, and I know you know that, of course, um, and I, I see where your question is coming from, of course. It just, you know, that data is clearly out there. And so the existence of the HIE doesn't change that. In fact, yeah, it helps, I guess. <laughs> right. That's what I was thinking, actually. I was thinking there may be more interest in either submitting the data and or having patients knowing that their data is back, you know, is, well, it's already up there, but having their providers be able to access it in the event of a, you know, cyber yeah. event. So I just was wondering if it changed people's mindsets on either side, consumers or providers. Such a good question. We've, we've definitely heard stories of a number of patients who went to their providers in the past couple of weeks or past two weeks and heard that they were now using the vital tools as their source of data. So. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a quick other question. Um, how much do you think, and maybe this is a question for Emily, um, how much do you think that the anticipated maintenance funding that we might be able to draw down from the federal government through this outcomes-based certification, how much will that offset the funding that has been coming through from the High Tech Act that's going to expire? Like how much, you know, what percentage of it will be maintain if in the event that that funding through the new stream is available to Vermont? Um, I wish that I had a straightforward answer to your question. What we're going to be doing over the next couple of months is proposing a new cost allocation methodology to CMS um, because basically um, high tech allowed us to um, uh, take the benefit to um, based on the number of providers serving Medicaid beneficiaries and what the new funding stream is focused on is patients. And so obviously the ratio of Medicaid patients to the total is much smaller than the number of providers serving Medicaid um, patients in Vermont. And so that's going to be something that we struggle with. Um, but we are um, feeling optimistic at this point because of CMS's intention to keep this work moving forward. And, um, in a lot of ways, we are going to be interacting with a new part of CMS that has never managed this type of work. So it's going to be a lot of going back and forth on what may work for this for this work in this tiny state. Um, so developing a new public funding model, I'd say, is the top of my priority list for the beginning part of 2021. And there are a lot of component parts. I hope that soon we'll have more answers. Well, good luck with that. It's important. Yeah. I appreciate your work. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I just had one question on when you looked at the deliverables that you had laid out for 2021. And um, first, thank you for the presentation. It was very thorough. Um, 
What risk do you see in meeting all of those deliverables, if any? And you know, either either from um, Emily or Beth, whoever wants to chime in. Beth, I'm happy to start. Do um, Please do. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I would say that the state and vital share a goal um, to not overextend our, ourselves and to continue this work going forward. Um, it's very important to meet expectations considering um, where we were just a couple of years ago and the really positive momentum that we have going forward. Um, and so I think that's our commitment. And so all of the conversations that we have about what's possible, um, um, consider what's what currently needs to be finished. Beth, I don't know if you want to put more color on that. Yeah, I think I would. Thank you. I mean, I think you're completely right. I think the, the one thing I would point to, and, and you, you heard this a little bit from us, I think in was it September that we presented um, our quarterly update, update? You know, we are a little behind on the, medic, the implementation of the new platform for next year. We have a new plan. We, you know, we've kind of re-estimated based upon what we've learned about the platform and the technology also our estimates of how much of our time will be focused on COVID work, right, which we didn't have on our plan, surprisingly, this year. Um, and I think we have a good a good plan to achieve all of these deliverables for next year. Great, thanks. So I have a question. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering if there's any relationship at all or any potential for integrating um, this, the interop, it's a hard word to pronounce, interoperability, uh, these new federal rules, um, to integrate those with uh, the new rule that's also coming out on January 1st, having to do with um, price transparency and uh, the negotiated rates uh, of, of, of providers, uh, along with estimates of um, out-of-pocket um, uh, expenses. Because it would just seem to me you know, here's a universal platform that we're trying to create, and and the first it has to do with a patient access to their records, and why wouldn't we want to try to integrate that with price transparency? So it's kind of one-stop shopping uh, for Vermonters. And the trace price transparency under the Support Act is that I believe where it's coming from. Yes, or, it's one that CMS announced I think in November. Uh, to go um, live January 1st, this January 1st? That is a really good question. Um, I don't know about um, the integration of federal rules, but I will say in, in sort of like the practice of CMS supporting our work, a lot of what we hear is um, better integrations of system, um, including pharmaceutical systems, our prescription drug monitoring um, program. Um, so it seems that they would be leaning that way and. Um, I'm sure look to states to see how that could be implemented. I haven't gotten a, a real directive though on the collaboration of that, but it's a, I mean, it's a good concept to be thinking about. I mean, from what, from what I've read that, uh, which it isn't that much, but uh, the data is gonna be readily available um, in a, a kind of a, a, a standard operating system. So, so it'll be there um, you know, the hospitals are going to have to produce it. Um, so I just, it just seems to me that, you know, rather than have this scattered around, um, if, if that could be integrated or, or really it would be helpful. Another, yeah, you uh, know, one thing that might come up is, so what, um, payers and HIEs and others are being asked to do is I, like, sort of, I keep using this analogy of a window. It's called an API opening the window to data, but they're not being asked to do like the actual, you know, application on your cell phone. So not you get to choose what app you use to get that data out of the window. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be interesting to see if application developers think of the same idea that you're thinking of, which is like, let's just create apps where we get, um, we provide access to all of the available data that might, that a patient might need, including yeah. price transparency. Yeah. Well, to me, it just seemed that there's the coming out of the starting blocks on January 1st of these two things going on at the same time and they seem on a common sense basis pretty related. But um, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question I had is kind of looking at the collaborative services work and and uh, <clears throat> the development uh, over the last year of estimates of what that saved the system, the the, the avoided cost, the value of of aligning these three entities, uh, you know, in a, in a unified way. And I'm wondering, as you begin to look at your um, kind of long-term funding approach, if if 
if it makes sense to kind of link uh, the benefits of uh, the H HIE system um, <clears throat> and with you know, who benefits and who pays. Um, right now, you know, with, with the high tech tax, it's a tax. Um, and, you know, certainly we would all support, I, at least I would support, you know, keeping that tax. It makes sense. But I'm just wondering out there in a, with a system that is, is, is there for a lot of people to benefit from, that the relationship between those who benefit and those who pay might be a little askew. And so as we go through the work programs, kind of looking at these, um, these areas where, like, for example, and I don't know this, I don't know whether the the uh, insurance plans that uh, that we lost with the GoBay decision, you know, I don't know how much they benefit by the system that we, you know, that we're talking about today, um, and how much those folks contribute um, to, to the support of the system. So, um, just thinking um, as you go through this, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, enter entertaining the linkage between who benefits with who pays might. Um, expose some areas where people you know, could could seek some long-term funding for you. And the, my final question, that wasn't a question, I guess that was an observation. <laughs> uh, but this is a question. One of the, when I first came on the board, one of the charts that astounded me was this, um, what are the driving forces of health and uh, behavior? And as this seemed well established because I saw this chart a lot um, that in, uh, in, in, in individual behaviors, 40%, genetics was 30%, healthcare was 10%, uh, environmental was 5%, and the social uh, circumstances, kind of the social determinants of health, were 15%. So um, I'm just I'm just wondering what what is the expected what is the expectation to be found from this pilot project with One Care in that context. Yeah, I mean, I'm on the side of things where we're providing data for um, the risk stratification work and the implementation that OneCare is doing. So probably better for um, others at AHS or OneCare to answer um, that question. But I will say sort of a related thing, which is I think um, many people in the healthcare industry, including payers, are really interested in, you know, addressing each of those component parts um, to shift the needle in a positive way. And so we've gotten a lot of interest um, in the social determinant of health work because of that, the committee, um, to define the policies and the protocols for making sure that that data is available, no matter what the effort is to, to address the facets of people's lives that impact their health and well-being. I mean, it makes sense, but, but uh, it's, I mean, it makes sense to me, uh, just kind of looking at, I mean, the, the, at those relationships, but I'm just wondering how this project developed in that context. Um, but so that that's my questions and observations. I, I think you've come a long way in the last two years. It's been, uh, the energy is palpable and, uh, you know, to see, uh, um, you know, the ability to kind of step into the shoes in, in this COVID 19 crisis and be an instrumental um, force in terms of uh, informing the public and contract uh, trace, uh, tracing folks is uh, is just a gift and thank you all for it. Any other questions from the board? Are you finished with the your presentation, Emily, completely? Yes. Okay. Sarah, could you um, walk us through our next steps? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go off video and start sharing slides again and I'll just walk folks through the staff review. I'm having a little trouble sharing slides, but maybe that. Emily so needs I think um, Emily's still sharing um, something on the screen. So maybe if she could exit the screen, there we go. Can you do it now, Sarah? Thanks, Emily. And then again, maybe not. <laughs> Let me give it one more 
one more try. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, Abigail, are you potentially able to pop these slides on the screen? Yeah, I just have to pull them up. Give me a second. Sure. Do you need me to shoot them over to you, Abigail? Sorry about this, folks. Are they showing up now? Yes. Yes, they are. Thank you. Just move them over. All right, thanks. Um, Abigail, will you go to slide four? Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So thanks so much to the team from Diva and Vital um, for that presentation. I'm just going to, as I said, walk us through the principles that we use to review the HIE plan and connectivity criteria, um, and then walk through um, the, the preliminary findings of the staff review. Um, so quick timeline and process reminder. Um, Diva submitted the plan to the board earlier this month as is required. We're currently in the middle of the special public comment period that Susan mentioned um, in her in her executive director's report. Uh, and that public comment period will end on November 30th. Um, today I'll walk us through the staff review. Following public comment, we'll have a staff recommendation and potential votes on December 2nd for both the HIE plan and connectivity criteria. Um, so a little bit of history on this. In 2018, when we received the, the, HI, the version of the HIE plan that um, this is an update to, um, staff pro proposed four principles for review. Um, they can really be summarized as alignment with our statute um, and alignment with the HIE plan statute, um, whether the HIE plan meets the goals of other recent relevant legislation, um, and whether the HIE plan incorporates national best practices and stakeholder input. Um, Abigail, will you go to slide six? Thank you. Um, so first is the HIE plan um, consistent with, um, with statute. Um, Section 9351 um, describes requirements for the plan, including supporting effective, efficient statewide use of electronic health information for a variety of purposes, uh, educating providers and the public, supporting interoperability, proposing strategic investments in technology and infrastructure, recommending funding, funding mechanisms, um, incorporating existing initiatives wherever possible, integrating the blueprint and other Medicaid information systems, um, and addressing issues related to governance and security. Um, it also specifies um, that the VHI is to use an opt-out consent model starting in March 2020. Uh, so the, the staff finding is that the HIE plan does meet each of these criteria. Uh, the plan approved in 2018 that this is based on really focused on setting a groundwork for thoughtful planning and investment. Um, and this update reports on work to, to further develop the foundational and exchange services that underpin um, all successful HIE efforts, the, the foundation and you know, walls and roof of the house that Emily was talking about. Um, and it also describes work to plan for the coming years that will, that will continue to further those aims. Um, this year's plan really reports major strides and describes upcoming work, particularly supporting interoperability and strategic technology and infrastructure investments through the Collaborative Services Project, um, which is also making big steps forward in Blueprint VHI integration as the Vermont Clinical Reg Registry System got folded into the VHI this year. Um, the HIE plan also includes an updated protocol for accessing um, PHI contained in the VHI in Appendix A, as you heard, um, which outlines how the opt-out consent model can function in terms of providers and the public entities, public health entities' access to patient data, um, which again is super timely this year. Um, planning for integration of additional data types is also moving forward. Um, particularly data produced by providers subject to 42 CFR Part 2 and other sensitive clinical data, as well as the social determinants of health data from Vermont, um, from state of Vermont data sources. Um, Abigail, will you move me to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, so that's kind of um, 
half of the, the statutory obligation side. The second half is related to um, how the HIE plan um, supports achieving the principles for healthcare reform. Um, Act 48 established 14 principles for healthcare reform, um, and in its 2018 decision to approve the HIE plan, the board found that the plan spoke to several of these principles, um, either directly or a little bit more indirectly. Um, these areas really still remain core to the 2020 update and have not changed. Um, so th those descriptions remain on this slide. But rather than read that to you, I just want to highlight that these principles for healthcare reform, um, I think, are really well aligned with those three HIE system goals that um, Emily described earlier and that are laid out in the HIE plan um, of creating one health record for every person to support clinical care, um, improving healthcare operations such as QI efforts and reporting, uh, and really supporting policymaking and evaluation. Um, I do want to note on the last, um, the last bullet on this slide that stakeholder engagement has changed somewhat from past years and especially due to COVID, um, but that there's a much broader collection of stakeholders engaged um, engaged in the development of the HIE plan and the, and the implementation of the HIE plan through those HIE steering committee subcommittees. So that, that's kind of more ongoing now. Um, next slide, please. The third principle um, focuses on alignment with other relevant legislation. So there, there wasn't um, big new legislation related to, to HIE or VITAL in 2020, but um, there, there was in 2017, 18, and 19, and I think those are all still quite relevant. So we've um, included a review of those. Um, as the board heard last year, implementing the consent change um, to, to opt out consent um, required by Act 53 was a major focus. Uh, of HIE work in 2019 and early 2020, particularly engaging key stakeholders and Vermonters um, around uh, what this change means for them um, and, and, and their options in terms of um, opting in or, or opting out or including their data in the BHI. Um, an evaluation of this policy change is included as Appendix G of this year's plan, which we wanted to highlight. Um, in addition, this year's update really demonstrates continued efforts to improve operational effectiveness and governance according to the goals of Act 73 and Act 187. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, does this plan incorporate best practices and expertise as well as feedback from stakeholders? Um, in terms of national best practices and expertise, the 2018 plan built on national standards and models for HIE governance and technology. Um, DIVA and the HIE Steering Committee consulted with the Federal Office of the National Coordinator for HIE, including experts from Colorado and Oklahoma, which both have very successful HIEs, so that we could learn about their governance and financing. Um, these best practices continue to under, underpin the, um, the updated HIE plan. Uh, and in terms of incorporating feedback from Vermonters, um, the HIE Steering Committee and its subcommittees include stakeholders from a variety of key HIE constituencies, including hospitals, FQHCs, DAs, One Care, payers, um, the Blueprint, and VDH. Um, and this includes high-level leadership as well as the high data users who can kind of inform on the more, more technical issues. Um, I'll note that COVID-19 hampered DIVA's efforts to kind of present directly to groups of practicing providers like CANCDC CAG, but expanded subcommittees in 2020, again, resulted in greater stakeholder participants participation in actual HIE plan development from the start. Um, on consent, uh, as required by Act 53, DIVA made major efforts to engage stakeholders and Vermonters in the HIE consent policy change, um, including the, the groups listed here on the slide. Um, in addition, DIVA hosted focus groups for Vermonters, um, specifically for Vermonters living with dis developmental disabilities and their families, Vermonters living with HIV AIDS, and refugees and new Americans, as well as three focus groups in different parts of the state um, that engage the general population of individuals seeking health care in Vermont. Um, work to engage and educate consumers on this change continued into 2020 as vital prepared to make the change to opt out consent in March. Um, would the board like to ha have any discussion or have any questions about the HIE plan um, assessment or should we move on to connectivity criteria and, and discuss at the end? Any questions from the board? I guess we'll move on. All righty. Um, next slide, please, Abigail. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the connectivity criteria, um, here we use two principles for the board's annual review, um, focusing on alignment with HIE plan goals and the clarity of the criteria themselves, since this is really an operational tool. Next slide, please. 
So first, are the proposed criteria in alignment with HIE plan goals, and will they support implementation of the plan and achievement of the state's health reform goals? Um, I believe the answer here is yes. Um, this year's connectivity criteria remain aligned with the HIE plan's goals and structure and will support increased availability of high-quality usable data, um, which is really critical to, uh, to achieving our health reform goals. The 2021 connectivity criteria made minor adjustments to the physical health criteria that, um, that are included in tiers two and three from last year, while adding mental health and behavioral health data elements to support exchange with, with DAs and other mental health or behavioral health providers. Um, this new data, these new data elements will um, support the goals of the HIE plan um, very much. Um, and then secondly, are the proposed criteria sufficiently clear to be operationalized by vital state and provider organizations? Um, and, and again, I believe the answer is yes. Um, these criteria were really developed to expand providers' abilities to submit and receive structured data from the VHI in part by providing specific standards and requirements to support providers in contract negotiations with the HR vendors. And that is all. Um, Abigail, do you mind going to the last slide? Um, thank you. So um, just to wrap up, I'll return to the board um, on December 2nd for the recommendation um, following the end of public comment period, which goes through November 30th. And that is all I have to present. Thank you. Are there any last minute questions for Sarah from the board? If not, I'm going to open it up for public comment for um, anything that um, that's been talked about from whether it's um, DIVA, VITAL, or, or the board. So public comment. I have a question. Go ahead, Dale. When it comes to the contact tracing, are they able to determine the accuracy of the data itself? in terms of even if there has been issues about people answering the questions honestly, or is it simply they're able to tell that flow of um, transmission? It, it seems relevant to me, and I haven't seen anybody really speak on it, how well the compliance is in terms of answering contact tracing questions. I might be revealing my age because I can remember the outbreaks in the old days before we had very many vaccines at all for anything and what that looked like. And that was actually a very relevant question back then. You had to answer honestly if you were contacted by a contact tracer. That was considered a huge offense if you did not. Um, not criminal in nature necessarily, but still huge as an offense. Um, any feedback on that from them? Anyone? So I'll answer. So my understanding of the way that the vital data is being used in contact tracing is more for using it for finding, finding, finding contacts. So once someone gives them a person's information, it might help them find an address or a phone number to be able to do the reach out. And I don't believe that they're using our data to actually identify who someone's who and a positive patient who has been in contact with. It's more for finding out how to get in touch with them. So I, I can't answer your question directly. OK, thank you. Is there any other public comment? Hi, this is Mort Wasserman. I have a question. Go ahead, Mort. So I was struck by the term physical health data um, in the presentation from Vital. And I was wondering if, if a provider lists as a problem so the de facto mental health uh, system for most Vermonters, children and adults, is actually the primary care system. It's not the uh, behavioral health system. So if I, as a provider, put down depression and I put on my medications 
uh, SSRI or some other medication, is that scrubbed or is that considered physical with air quotes health data? You know, in terms of the data repository, we don't we don't designate whether something is fits into a category. But as we're working with providers and organizations to onboard them and to try and get as much quality data, we take into account what type of data provider they are. Um, and these, the criteria and the connectivity criteria are just the minimum we're looking for. It's not that we won't accept any data that they can provide on the patient. It's just to say, have they met a minimum data quality standard to participate in some of the downstream programs effectively? Right. So this isn't a data quality comment. This is a data comment, uh, content comment. It sounds like there are plenty of behavioral health data. Uh, and I believe as a provider who is seeing patients, I'd want to know what medications and what diagnoses had uh, been given to a, a patient that I didn't actually know. So it seems like there are plenty of behavioral health data in the current physical air quotes again, health data, which is reassuring to me. And the behavior, adding behavioral health from the behavioral health providers is only a fraction of mental health and behavioral health problems for Vermont. And so even, even a primary care provider who has permi permission, permission to uh, treat patients for substance abuse, I would assume her data are also the problem list substance abuse disorder might also be in that quote physical data unquote it could absolutely be so you know the first step in the process is to have the organization that we're looking to onboard go through that criteria and say what do they even collect in terms of their care that they provide because each organization we work with is slightly different um, so we find out what they provide and then we say okay you know if you are, if you have that data, if you are generating those types of data, can we get it into the the electronic submissions to the VI? Right. And we use the the criteria to really prioritize. If you don't have much of it in there, if you only have 10% in there, we use that list that's in the criteria to prioritize what are the top things that would make the most impact. And tier two would be the first places we would focus, and then we would say, okay, great, you did tier two this year, let's work on tier two next year, because, you know, that's going to be a much bigger lift and your EMR vendor might have some work to do, or you have some workflow processes that you need to re-implement or, um, or work on to be able to provide that data in a discrete format. So uh, it's, it's really the, the baseline by which we can somehow measure data quality. It's not to say, that we're going to only accept one type of data or another from an organization, if that makes more sense. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, is there other public comment? Hearing none, I wish to thank everybody for the uh, very uh, um, succinct and informative presentation. So thank you. The next item on the agenda is old business for the board. I'm going to call on Mike Barber to make an announcement. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I just need to announce the board's uh, decision on the 2021 large group HMO rate filing of MVP health plan. Uh, MVP proposed a uh, negative 1.2% annual rate change for members renewing in the first quarter of 2021. On November 12th, 2020, the board modified and then approved the filing, resulting in an average annual rate change of approximately minus 4.6%. There are approximately 2,100 members enrolled in these large group plans in Vermont. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Is there any other old business to come before the board at this time?